Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute, I tell you. You ain't heard nothing. Hello and welcome to this edition of Recent Reads. I recently read The House of Mirth by Edith Wharton. I wasn't sure what to expect because I had tried reading The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton many years ago and DNF'd it. I suspect the fault was mine and not Edith Wharton's because while reading The House of Mirth I realised that she was an accomplished writer. Her writing has depth and subtlety and is intellectually engaging as well as being enormously entertaining. I thoroughly enjoyed The House of Mirth but I think I read it too quickly. Edith Wharton's writing is so subtle that it requires and deserves more attention than I think I gave it. I think I will get more out of it on a reread. Here is the blurb. The House of Mirth tells the story of Lily Bart, aged 29, beautiful, impoverished and in need of a rich husband to safeguard her place in the social elite and to support her expensive habits, her clothes, her charities and her gambling. Unwilling to marry without both love and money, Lily becomes vulnerable to the kind of gossip and slander which attach to a girl who has been on the marriage market for too long. Wharton charts the course of Louis's life, providing along the way a wider picture of a society in transition, a rapidly changing New York where the old certainties of manners, morals and family have disappeared and the individual has become an expendable commodity. The House of Mirth was published in October 1905 to widespread critical acclaim. It became an instant bestseller and is regarded today as one of Edith Wharton's most accomplished and compelling social satires. I wholeheartedly agree with that last statement and therefore can wholeheartedly recommend The House of Mirth and my rating of course is A. For my Chunksters reading challenge, I read four historical novels by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The first was Sir Nigel. Sir Nigel is set during the Hundred Years' War over the right to rule the Kingdom of France and is a prequel to Doyle's earlier novel, The White Company, which is why I read it first. It describes the early life of that book's hero, Sir Nigel Loring in the service of King Edward III at the start of the Hundred Years' War. I'm glad I read this first, which I'll explain in a moment. Nigel Loring, at the beginning of this book, is a squire who aspires to be a knight-errant. He is in love and, before going off to war, makes a vow to his lady, as all knight-errants do, that he will perform three deeds of arms to be worthy of her. The story is of how he embarks on various adventures and fulfills his vow and eventually marries the lady of whom he is now worthy. I found this very entertaining and enjoyable and I rated it A. Then I read The White Company and in this novel Sir Nigel is an idiot. He is again required to go to a war and at every opportunity he seeks to engage in deeds of arms to uphold the honour of his lady. Every major character in this novel begins every conversation with an oath, such as by St Ives, by the Rood, by St Paul, by these ten finger bones, by the Virgin of Tinnus, by the saints, by my hilt. If Dor wanted to give some sense of authenticity to the conversations of characters living in the 14th and 15th centuries, then a few of these oaths sprinkled throughout the novel might have sufficed, but to make every character use these oaths in every chapter of the book is merely to caricature, caricature them. And this is what Sir Nigel is, a caricature of a knight errant, such as was caricatured by Cervantes in Don Quixote. 
Don Quixote can be forgiven for his foolishness because he was off his head. But Sir Nigel is sane and therefore has no excuse for his foolishness. Here's a typical example, one of many, in which he challenges another knight to a deed of arms. By St. Paul, list Sir Nigel, this is certainly a man whom it is worth journeying far to know. Go tell him that a humble knight of England would make his further honourable acquaintance, not from any presumption, pride or ill will, but for the advancement of chivalry and the glory of our ladies. Give him greeting from Sir Nigel Loring, and say that the glove which I bear in my cap belongs to the most peerless and lovely of her sex, whom I am now ready to uphold against any lady whose claim he might be desirous of advancing. Again, this might have been okay as a one-off, but this sort of nonsense is repeated ad nauseum throughout the novel, together with the proliferation of those tiresome oaths. Now you know why I said that I am glad I read Sir Nigel before reading The White Company, because after reading The White Company, I don't think I could have brought myself to read Sir Nigel straight after it. My rating for The White Company is C, and I do not recommend that anyone else should read this load of tosh. The next historical novel I read by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was The Refugees, and this was excellent. Of the first three, this was by far the superior novel. It was entertaining, informative and interesting. The Refugees revolves around Amory de Catinet, a Huguenot guardsman of Louis XIV, and Amos Green, an American who comes to visit France. Major themes include Louis XIV's marriage to Madame de Maintenon, retirement from court of Madame de Montespan, the revoking of the Edict of Nantes, and the subsequent emigration of the Huguenot de Catinets to America. The novel is divided into two halves, the first taking place in France and the second taking place in Canada and America. Both ha halves are of enormous interest. The first establishes the characters with whom we are concerned, and the second covers their adventures as they flee the Huguenot persecutions in France in the 18th century. I thoroughly recommend this highly accomplished novel, and my rating is A. The final historical novel I read by Dole was Rodney Stone. This is actually the story of Rodney Stone's friend Jim Harrison, but it is told by Rodney Stone as a first-person narrative. There are two main threads which are interwoven throughout the novel. At the heart of the novel there is a mystery concerning Boy Jim, as he is called, which is ingeniously resolved at the end of the novel. The other is an extended narrative dealing with the famous bare-knuckle boxers of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, such as Jim Belcher, John Jackson, Daniel Mendoza, Dutch Sam and others. The book includes vignettes of a number of historical personages, notably the Prince Regent, Lord Nelson, Sir John Lade, Lord Cochrane and Beau Brummel. In terms of interest and accomplishment, I would say Rodney Stone falls between Sir Nigel and the refugees. In order of preference, therefore, my ranking is 1. The Refugees, 2. Sir Nigel, 3. Rodney Stone and 4. The White Company. The first two I highly recommend. The third is worth reading, and the last not at all. And after completing these four novels, I donated £12 to Book Aid International. Total donations to Book Aid International to date total £934. Thank you to everyone who has continued to participate in the Chunks of Reading Challenge and to donate to this great book-related charity. I also read three plays by William Shakespeare, Twelfth Night and Troilus and Cressida, both of which were rereads. I also read Measure for Measure for the first time. I hadn't read this play before because I had read that it was one of Shakespeare's problem plays, but I think that it was only in terms of its classification. Is it a comedy or a tragedy? Having now read it, I think it was a tragic comedy. It has tragic elements in the telling, but ends in the classic comedy style of a happy resolution with marriages and forgiveness of wrongs at the end. 
I now understand why this play is a problem, because it is morally ambiguous. I thought that the arbitrary abuse of power by the Duke's deputy, both in condemning a fornicator to be executed and then committing the same sin himself with the condemned man's sister and then reneging on his deal to let her brother go free, was dealt with too leniently. Forgiveness is all very well, but when it is misapplied, it makes a mockery of justice. So, in some respects, although this is an enjoyable play to read in the telling, it has an unsatisfactory and arbitrarily comedic conclusion. And now, here's a quick recap, and I'll be back soon with another BookTube video.